morning guests delegates and everyone present here i dr aditi tawre and i tejaswini bojappa students of mba hospital and healthcare management symbiosis institute of health sciences would like to proceed with the next session and the topic for the session is decoding global health diplomacy need of the hour the role of diplomacy in health is vital india is expanding its global diplomatic footprint not only in politics but in the field of healthcare as well health diplomacy takes place at many levels be it a vaccine diplomacy or conducting the evacuation operations at short notice to bring back its citizens back at the peak of the pandemic india's engagement in technology training of medical professionals and its role in enhancing the global diplomatic pandemic response is known to the world today this session highlights the same it's an honor to call upon professor shivali lavle director of symbiosis school of international studies to discuss more about the global health diplomacy ma'am holds a degree in masters of philosophy in international cooperation education and training from the sorbonne university ma in international relations from the university of bath and sciences paris along with this ma'am has over a decade of experience working with the unesco headquarters paris as a program specialist in two of their prime education programs namely education for all and education for sustainable development i now request ma'am to introduce the speakers and proceed with the session good morning um honorable chancellor sir dr sp mozumdar dr rajiv yadavdekar distinguished guests students faculty and of course the speaker delegates global health diplomacy as our young friends have just described it is indeed the need of the hour this session is going to be a slight departure from the topics that you have discussed over the last two days it's a very very interesting session it's going to be a very interesting session but like i mentioned it incorporates um various aspects of diplomacy this vaccine diplomacy vaccine nationalism we're also talking about humanitarian assistance so there are various aspects to it i'm not going to waste any more time let me invite on stage our three very distinguished speakers general tutakne sir M. Ashil Bhushan Gokhale sir, and Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed sir. Let me take a minute to introduce the three speakers. The first speaker of the day is General Dr. M. A. Tutakne. I don't think he needs an introduction, but nonetheless, let me take a minute. Sir has a postgraduate is a postgraduate professor in dermatology at the Armed Forces Medical College Pune. He was the dean of the AFMC in 1997 and commandant of the institution in 2000. He has several accolades to his name. He has won the Amir Chand award for best research work in the armed forces in 1985. He has also he's also the recipient of the Full Ford National Oration Award by IADVL in 1985, the Atit Vishishta Seva Medal, the AVSM, that was awarded by the President of India in 2002. He's also the first uh, Vice Chancellor of SIU. Sir, may I please request you to deliver your remarks? <coughs> Good morning everybody. Honored to be here. We just heard a brilliant talk from Dr. Sanjay Oak 
where he started that the problem is that there are no interpersonal talks. But in our subject, diplomacy, we cannot do without interpersonal talks. But of course, that I leave to our ambassador, Talmi Zahmet, to talk about. I'll try and concentrate on the health and the health aspects. Next slide, please. Can I move it myself? <clears throat> yeah. Well, um, today, of course, uh, health is definitely accepted as one of the major drivers of international relations. And uh, I'm very happy to mention here that SIU has realized this quite a lot of time earlier. It was the first international relations conference that we had in 2013, had a separate uh, session on the health. Now the aspects of health which affect the international relations or the vice versa, I'll divide into two. The effect of globalization on health and health issues which affect the international relations. Well, health was never a national subject because neither the diseases knew the boundaries of the nations nor the healthcare knows the boundaries of the nation. Way back in Ramayan period also, we all know that Lakshman was treated by Sushen, who was the Vaidya in Ravan's uh, kingdom, or Ravan's army. Even uh, today, when uh, in 19, after 1971 war, we had 93,000 odd prisoners with us. Uh, entire medical care for these people was given by the armed forces. And I can say this with an absolute personal uh, vouching because I was there in Agra at that time and looking after the hospital that was set up for the POWs, where the treating physicians were also from there. So, it has never been so. It has always been an international topic. But importance of health in international relations is now being realized. Let us be on the same page. So, let me define, give a few definitions. Definition of health as per WHO is known to everybody, so I will not repeat it. For international relations and international business, health is a public good. And that must be remembered, that health is an asset of the nation. Public health or population's health is an asset of the nation. But for understanding what really is the importance of health, please remember, health is the continuum between life and death. It prevents the death from overpowering the life. And as some... Shriar has said it, Kya zindagi maut teri manzil ho hi nahi sakti, a zindagi maut teri manzil ho hi nahi sakti, kyunki jab tak tu hai, maut ahi nahi sakti. So if you are healthy, life can continue. But what is the definition of global health? And please remember, this is very important to remember that global health is an area of study, research, and practice that places priority in improving the health equity all over. The inequality in the health care is not acceptable. That is the meaning of the word global health. And we all know the reality of life is there is an amount of, fair amount of inequality, inequity in the health care provided. And what is global health diplomacy is the practice by which the governments follow this to make equity in healthcare as best as possible. Well, as far back as 1978, the UNICEF conference had made this declaration that the gross inequalities in the state of, of health of people is not acceptable. Even within the country, the disparity in the healthcare available to urban and rural, rich and poor is not acceptable. And frankly, for the medical officers, medical practitioners over here, I feel that uh, this is one of the reasons why there is so much of mistrust on the medical profession and whatever we are seeing today 
the distrust and the violence that takes place for the medical profession. Because inequality in healthcare is very difficult to accept. It is easier to accept differences in the housing, differences in the travel, and differences in the hotel. But when it comes to healthcare, any feeling that the healthcare provided to me is a little less is very damaging and not at all acceptable. But we all know that there is a big difference. I'll not talk much on this. Uh, even today's newspaper said that there is a five year or six years difference in life between the upper caste and the so-called scheduled caste and scheduled tribes for various reasons. And that is not acceptable, but it's a fact of life that access to health care depends upon various factors. Now let us, uh, let me just quickly enumerate the effect of globalization or global interconnectedness on health. We see that the vectors also can travel along with the people. So we see vectors be getting distributed, novel infections. We had SARS some time ago and now of course, COVID has really placed the importance of international relations, health and international relations at a higher pedestal. The increase in drug resistance, the changes in the epidemiology, technological improvement, when it happens in one place, if it must come very quickly to the other. The changing pattern of human behavior and restructuring of the health industry. These are all the factors of globalization or global interconnectedness which affect the health. And uh, to, to make sure that the inequalities are removed or the diseases don't spread. This is a statement made by the Center for Disease Control in USA is very important that the most effective and least expensive way to protect America from diseases and other health threats that begin overseas is to stop them before they spread to America. And whatever help the rich nations are giving to the poor countries is also in their own interest because they want to control those diseases there, there and there only. And health, and health, hence the health, global health goal includes that all over the world, this inequity in the healthcare must be removed. Now, the health, health aspects or the diseases, aspects of diseases which affect the international relations and security are listed over here. The emerging diseases we already mentioned economic instability, again, allows the diseases to spread and public good health being compromised. The humanitarian emergency, including war, chemical, biological radiation, environment threat, and diseases like <coughs> it was HIV AIDS in 2018-19 more. Today it is COVID and probably SARS. And hence, it needs of building health security and Now, uh, international relations mainly dealt with security to start with, then economics in the subsequent era when money was the power, today knowledge is the power, so human interaction including health is a major driver, the force, and uh, the Global health security agenda has been formulated by a group of 60 countries which came together and they work through what they call as action packages which are to be followed by all the countries with the object that the diseases should not spread, health care should be provided and in general the global health must improve. The G7 partners and European Union assists 76 countries for this and US helps 32 countries. The COVID-19 pandemic, of course, has highlighted the importance of this. Now, in a few words, can we use the healthcare aspects, the medical education, etc., to be used as a software, soft power, 
for influencing the diplomacy and the aspects that are relevant to us, medical education, medical tourism, a lot of improvement in medical tourism did take place, the drug trials, which came a big way to India, but has now somehow reduced, and traditional medicine and yoga, which is being propagated by the government. Now, I'm quoting with reference to medical education, two articles, one of them, which says that the WHO and the World Federation of Medical Education. There is a World Federation of Medical Education of which the chairman till a few years ago was our own ex-MCI chairman, Dr. Ketan Desai. They have done a lot of work in trying to bring the medical education, world, medical education schools worldwide together and improve the standards. The, but their efforts is not their efforts have not been very well recognized or not given much of importance. In 50s and 60s, it was basically to foster that the Western medicine is more important and Western medicine should be practiced. In 17 and 80s, they wanted to propagate the WHO's theme that primary health is the important aspect of healthcare. And from 80s onwards, the campaign is to have common standards to have accreditations and make sure that the uh, medical colleges are rated. We have, uh, you all, medical people must have all seen the recent publications of the standards of medical colleges in which India features through two medical colleges, or two or three medical colleges, the AIMS, AFMC, and Velour. But their, their efforts to standardize are very difficult because accreditation processes could be different and standards and priorities used could be quite different. The healthcare market, another article which says that healthcare market is expanding because of globalization of education. A number of trends have emerged which says, which has fostered private educate, private medical schools increase in medical schools. There is a tremendous increase in medical schools. Today, the world has almost 4,000 medical colleges, medical schools. And uh, it is found that there is no doubt that all over the world there is a requirement to increase the medical schools because the number of physicians as required for the population is still less, much less in India. World over there is a deficiency and there is a deficiency not only for the medical personnel, but also the paramedical personnel and so on. So that increase in number is a must, is a requirement, but meeting the standards and comparing every is not very easy. What is the status of medical education in India? In India, 15 lakh students try to compete for 88,000 seats. So you can imagine what is the difference, 20 to 25,000 or 30,000 students go abroad for study. If we want to use our medical education as a software to attract people to come to India, things must change. Today, China, Ukraine, Russia, any number of countries, Mauritius, Nepal are getting Indian students for doing their MBBS, we get very few foreign students in selected, selected medical colleges. And this is in spite of the fact that the Indian medi medical education is considered quite good. The Indian doctors abroad in Western countries are in great, great demand. So how can we utilize the medical education for improving their reasons for why medical education is not uh, attracting foreign students are, is, is very well known. The, as it is, the number of seats is very few, insufficient for Indians themselves. High cost of medical education and very stringent regulations by the National Medical Commission and its precursor MCI. It requires about 7 lakh square feet for a 100 admission 
medical college and 140 teachers are required to be in position in place right on the first day so i quote the two stalwarts of medical education dr devi shetty from bangalore and dr k shrinath reddy who have been repeatedly calling that the regulatory framework to facilitate addition of capacity is a must the government must take a cue from various foreign countries where so much of space requirement is not there can we do better we have to do better in case you want to but there are some encouraging development in the recent times which must take number one is there is a big change in the education policy the new education policy is very flexible and i hope ugc has already government has taken has approved it ugc has taken cognizance and things have started changing now very recently ugc has permitted two degrees to be held simultaneously ugc is permitting the collaboration with foreign universities for various things training for joint degrees and so on and so forth and this will probably be a big game changer pm recently announced that he wants to have a medical college in each district i hope that comes through encouraging the private uh, medical colleges he very recently he also gave a statement that private institutions must be encouraged because government doesn't have all that money government is now encouraging the ayush hospitals also the traditional medicine hospitals also and very recently cabinet has approved the who global center for traditional medicine in india established in jamnagar very recently government has also announced that they will give special visa to people abroad who want to come to india for treat for treatment through ayush systems can we use the ayush systems because they are better off or slightly stronger in taking care of chronic non serious ailments and also preventive and promotive health care yoga of course you all know is being propagated all over the world very recently the government has also come out with a paper to create well defined health care management cadre this is the announcement of establishment of the who global center for traditional medicine and this is the cadre proposed by the government this is this paper was uh, this uh, booklet was uh, issued in march uh, 22 and uh, hope that all states was health is a state subject with the hope that states will take it up the cadres defined are public health cadre which is basically meant for medical doctors with preventive degree, preventive medicine degrees the health management cadres which includes both health and non health administrative professionals like mbas to come and manage the healthcare system it includes the specialists those who are only specialists and the teaching cadres defined by the mci what is in my opinion missing is the cadre of really treating doctors whom we would prefer to call as family physicians who in my opinion should be the backbone of medical treatment now since the since the medical education india is actually quite good because the doctors are respected if the regulatory changes take place and capacity is increased increased india can attract foreign students to come to india and study medicine and also the allied professionals improvement in medical tourism can take place similarly also the drug trials will take place if regulations are similarly treated so this is where i uh, where i end and leave it to the diplomats to take cover take over the yes. thank you very much thank you sir the role or rather the task that i have been given to moderate the session is always a difficult one So our next, next distinguished speaker, M. Marshal Bhushan Gokhale sir, if I may, please request you to keep time, or I would have to then pass a little note uh, to you. Um, a very quick introduction, sir. If you, if you, if you can just give me um, a few seconds. 
M. Ashur Bhushan Gokhale is a highly decorated officer. He has won the Agni Award, the Param Vishisht Seva Medal, the Ati Vishisht Seva Medal, the Vayu Sena Medal, and the Paul Harris Fellow. He has had a distinguished career in the Air Force. So without further ado, sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Respected Dr. Mzubnar, Dr. Rajiv Erbarkar, Professor Shivali and my fellow panelists, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you. It's indeed nice to be here at the Symbiosis University and talking about diplomacy at large, the motto of Symbiosis, that is Vasudeva Kutumbakam, is itself a mantra for diplomacy and in particular for global health diplomacy. Because like in a family, we take care of each other. I'm sure that if this is extended to the countries and India takes a leading role in that to ensure health for all. We have also, there are many subsets that happen. Humanitarian assistance is something that India is very good at and that's what I'm going to speak about. Over the years, different subsets of diplomacy have emerged, which have strengthened India in projecting her comprehensive image abroad. In this, use of soft power becomes a very important subset. Education, as mentioned by the previous speaker, culture, humanitarian assistance during disaster, and medical assistance at the time of health emergencies are some of the important components of this soft power projection. The Indian subcontinent with diverse terrain and weather condition has been listed by the United Nations as the third most natural disaster prone region. Floods, cyclones, earthquakes have been occurring at regular intervals within India and in our neighborhood. The Indian Armed Forces, which have a national footprint, are invariably the first and the fastest responders in such disasters to provide essential aid, casualty evacuation, and of course, medical support. Over the years, we have fine-tuned the procedures for disaster relief, and we now work under the central guidelines of National Disaster Management Authority, or NDMA for short. While disaster management and mitigation teams at the district level are being established, like in Talegao, close to Pune, the expertise and means of transportation available with the armed forces are invariably called upon for assistance. This expertise has helped the armed forces to quickly press into action what can be termed as dual use equipment. And that is how all of you must have witnessed the tireless effort by the Indian Air Force C-17 aircraft, what is called as the Operation Ganga, to the countries near Ukraine to airlift our stranded medical students from the war zone area. I was speaking to some of the crew at Hinden as well as those in charge at air headquarters, and let me mention that the crew was physically stretched because the window of providing air evacuation was very limited. While the government and diplomats on the ground were busy ensuring safe corridors, and providing transportation to these students to the closest airfields in Poland, Slovakia, and Romania, the C-17s had to fly avoiding restricted areas and air spaces of Pakistan, which does not allow overflying since the Balakot days. The aircraft also had a medical unit to cater to first aid for the students, and in one case, a student was brought back safely having suffered a bullet injury. We not only brought back the Indian students, but also those from many other neighboring countries earning kudos for their safe evacuation. Incidentally, while India has abstained from taking any stand in this war, these aircraft, while going to various airfields around Ukraine, also carried tentage, blankets, medicines, and many other items of aid for the beleaguered population. India nowadays is at the forefront of providing disaster relief, whether in combat conditions or during peace. For the last two and a half years, all of us have witnessed the pandemic of COVID-19, and somehow it does not seem to be abating. Whether man-made or otherwise, I must acknowledge 
the yeoman service carried out by the medical fraternity and salute you all for being the COVID warriors. India once again was at the forefront providing medicines and later on the two indigenously produced vaccines to many countries of the world. That was another term which got coined called the vaccine diplomacy. Operation Sanjeevani was specific to Maldives, wherein we had also set up a hospital. I remember speaking to Colonel Sajjad of Bangladesh last year when I had invited him to speak at the 50 years of Swarnim Vijay Varsh lectures I had organized. Incidentally, he was conferred with Padma Shri last year by the Indian government for his outstanding role as a liberation warrior of the Bangladesh Mukti Bayani. He mentioned that he had received the Indian vaccination free and was lucky as some other country which had promised vaccination at a price was not popular. As some of you would know, the Pune Air Force airfield was due for resurfacing, but due to much needed urgency of vaccine transportation from Serum Institute to places in India and abroad, the work was deliberately withheld for over nine months and thereafter completed in record time of six weeks. Incidentally, the very first isolation hospital was set up by the Indian Army and the Medical Corps at Delhi in March 2020. Air Force aircraft and naval ships were also used to transport much needed oxygen pods and plants from various countries during the second wave which had affected the country badly. Since Air Force uses 100% pure oxygen for flying for medical reasons, some of the reserves were also diverted during this time. And amongst all this came the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan and rapid withdrawal of not only the Indian Embassy and consulate staff, but also many other Indian professionals, health workers, teachers, and civilians who wished to escape from there. We also airlifted other nationals and again in very adverse conditions. Incidentally, today, although we don't have diplomatic relations, or rather no country has diplomatic relations with the Taliban control of Afghanistan, we are still sending wheat and other medicines to Afghanistan for their population. The role of helicopters is just amazing. They have done a lot of flying, taking doctors and polio drops to far-flung areas, villages in Himalayan region of not only within India, but also Nepal, Bhutan, and Myanmar. Thanks to the efforts of health ministry and NGOs like Rotary, India is today free from polio. In 1998, I was commanding Gorakhpur when all the tributaries of Ganga flowing out of Nepal were at, sp were at spate. Other than the Air Force station, which is thankfully at a higher elevation, there was water everywhere. I also had a satellite base to look after at Darbanga, which is north of Patna. The station personnel, including the ladies, were working through the night to prepare puri and sabji to be wrapped in plastic for it to be either delivered or airdropped to lakhs of people marooned at many places. Soon the local administration also joined in. I had named this operation FROG, or Flood Relief Operations from Gorakhpur, which had made international headlines. The work continued for almost a fortnight and I used to fly sometimes in the helicopter for the evacuation sorties. When you pick up a few of those stranded people and then look into the eyes of those left behind, helplessly waiting for their turn, it can really stir a lot of emotions on the pilots. So I had to caution a lot of pilots not to overload the aircraft, otherwise there could be accidents. I remember the former Prime Minister, Vajpayeeji, visiting us to give a pat on our back, along with the Chief Secretary, Mr. Shri Govind Narayan, the Prime Minister wrote a very nice message in the visitor's book praising the effort. I also went to Darbanga off and on and flying with the local commissioner for an aerial survey. When our helicopter was landing back at Darbanga, I saw another civilian helicopter on ground. The Chief Minister of Bihar, Srimati Rabri Devi, along with her husband, Sri Lalu Prasad Yadav, were also taking stock of the flood situation. During our meeting, he asked me if there were any points from my side. One important point I had mentioned was that the food and clothes we were dropping must also include few pouches of safe drinking water, as there was water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. Sri Lalu Prasad Yadav was very quick and ordered immediate inclusion of water pouches, which are used in train journeys 
since he was already a railway minister and knew about these. I've had many first-hand experiences in handling supervising disasters. During tsunami, our airbase at Kardikupa was badly affected. We ourselves lost over 100 people, like it happened during Bhuj earthquake. At both these places, at Bhuj and Karnik, we now have a memorial in their memory. At Karnik, the houses and messes of the beach, along the beach, were submerged and washed away. But it was amazing to witness the grit of a helicopter pilots to fly in their night dresses as the tsunami had hit during the night and they had to run out towards the runway in whatever they were wearing. They flew like that to rescue many people till we could send relief from Chennai and Bangalore. While I was overseeing the logistics flow, I remember one VIP wanting to send hundreds of toothpaste the very next day and insisting on taking a photograph with that load in the aircraft. I had a tough time convincing him that we will send these in due course of time after ensuring essential supplies of food, medicine, clothes, which are to be sent first. During tsunami, as part of Operation Castor and Rainbow, the Indian naval ships had taken loads of relief material to Indonesia, Sri Lanka, and Maldives, as also to Andaman and Nicobar Islands. We also take part in United Nations peacekeeping operations. And I remember visiting the deployments in Congo and Sudan. At both these places, the medical help provided to the civilians was noteworthy. And I remember meeting our ambassadors at Congo and Sudan who were very proud of our contingents. There was not a single case of indiscipline, sexual exploitation, smuggling, or AIDS infection. We have taken part in many other humanitarian relief operations, including sending two aircraft with relief material all the way to the US after Hurricane Katrina had hit New Orleans in August 2005. Similarly, to Manamar in April 2008 after Cyclone Nergis had caused a lot of damage. Then was the aid to Nepal as Operation Maitri after the earthquake of April 2015 and rescuing Indians and other foreign nationals by the naval ships and IF aircraft from Yemen when the war erupted between Houthis and Saudi Arabia in April 2015. We had called it Operation Rahat. In the last few years, Indian Armed Forces have modernized their equipment for faster relief. We use satellite imagery and drones for initial recce like it was done in Uttarakhand flash floods of 2021. These are followed by helicopter taking rescue teams and medical units. Simultaneously, the Army engineers are pressed into service to build access roads, bridges, etc. It is an integrated operation with civil administration and NDRF teams joining hands to provide all the possible help at the earliest. A number of NGOs and other volunteers also add to this effort. The armed forces have also established modern meteorological and radar sensors so that adverse weather conditions can be detected early enough to warn the people in advance. What is of importance for the medical and scientific community is to come up with sensors for the modern emerging threats of chemical and biological weapons by the state or non-state actors and also for some newer infirmities like Havana syndrome, presumably caused by microwave radiation. I must acknowledge that whenever there is a national emergency, be it in war or peace, the civilian population responds very promptly and positively. And that is between nations also. In October 1995, when Pakistan was affected by a massive earthquake, we had sent food and other medical aid, as well as channel $25 million aid to Pakistan. In turn, Pakistan had reciprocated by sending three Hercules aircraft loaded with blankets and other essentials during the Bhuj earthquake of January 2001. I must add that the effort by the medical corps during all these disasters has been really noteworthy, and we must give these medical warriors a big round of applause. Thank you, Lady Chairman. Jai Hind. Thank you, sir, and apologies for um, hurrying you up because we, we're re really running out of time. Our last speaker, Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed. Yes, sir, please. A very quick introduction. Sir has served as ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Oman, and UAE. He was additional secretary for international cooperation at the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas. He was also the director general of the ICWA. He was the head of the Gulf and Hajj. Uh, Hajj uh, unit. He has also won 
a lot of accolades, one of them being the King Abdulaziz Medal. So, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Respected Chancellor, Dr. Majumdar, Dr. Rajiv Yaraudekar, distinguished faculty, ladies and gentlemen. It's a delight to be addressing a live audience. Who would have thought as 2019 ended that for two and a half years we would be in a kind of wilderness, a national and global wilderness, that one of the worst disasters that has, had, uh, that has hit humankind would be upon us and we would be witnesses to it and many of us would be victims as well in some shape or form. The world that we knew perhaps no longer exists and may perhaps not even be revived again. The implications of the experience of the pandemic will take a very long time to be experienced, to be realized. There have been almost every life on this earth, on this planet, has been affected by this. Young people have had their education disrupted. Older people have paid with their lives. Large numbers of people have suffered extraordinary economic privation. And we have not recovered as yet. What we are looking at is a narrow window of opportunity that has briefly opened up because it, is, it appears as if the Omicron is not as lethal as the second wave that had hit us some months ago. But we don't know enough. We are struggling to even understand what is happening in medical terms and in health terms, much less in economic terms. We have a long, long way to go. What have we experienced so far? The globalized, connected world, the world in which we flourished and were successful, has taken a very major hit. There is now a kind of concern about globalization. That do we really need all these value chains and supply chains stretching from one end of the world to the other? A kind of camaraderie where an item used to be produced in 5, 10, 15 or 20 countries before it reached the retail market. There is a questioning of our commitment to globalization and a narrowing of our vision and our purpose. There is also this synchronizes with something which is deep within us individually, a kind of loosening of ties that we used to have with others within the family and the larger world in which we live. And this is another concern, a psychological concern of moving away from people, others. So there is a larger, most, a stronger focus, a psychological damage which will not be repaired very quickly of defining us from the other. And this is the pandemic's paradox. That just as we all know that the pandemic demands cooperation, and that the pandemic does not respect national borders. It is precisely at that time that we distance ourselves from each other and bring down very massive controls at the borders and refuse to cooperate the way we should. And this is a paradox that still remains vibrant as I speak to you. What did we see? Instead of international cooperation, we actually saw national borders closing in major restrictions in terms of travel. Many countries were insulted that their nationals were not allowed and there was a selective policy. Governments did not even know what to do. They were knee-jerk actions. Governments were truly terrified with this extraordinary horror that was upon them. We also then, we had talked for so many decades about free markets and overnight we pandered to protectionism. And we said, we will not import this, we will not export this, and we will not allow this to come in. And there was a very aggressive posture in this regard. And we noticed that this was the one pandemic that affected the developed countries more fiercely than they affected the developing countries. And the United States led from the front in a collapse of its medical system and had the highest number of people who succumbed to the disease. 
it still remains number one. Many other countries of Western Europe were equally bewildered, and therefore there was no role model for us to follow. They were, in fact, much worse off than many of us. And Bruno Macias has recently written that the Asian countries showed far greater sense of discipline, sense of purpose, and sense of clarity in terms of policies than the developed countries. Developed countries' strength was technology. It is they who then finally developed the vaccine in record time. That is the one that saved many lives later on. Many regional, uh, many regional cooperation institutions just failed to, uh, to perform. The G7 could not meet properly for a long time. And when they met, there was acrimony because the Americans insisted that in the joint statement, there should be a reference to the Wuhan virus. And as you remember, uh, you know, Donald Trump, a hardcore racist, used to speak of Kung Flu and uh, stereotyping Chinese people. And there was, of course, great power competition. And that was the reality. The whole point, as far as Washington was concerned, to demonize China even as their scenario collapsed. And hundreds of thousands of people died in their hospitals and at home. It was China that was then painted as the evil demon. And the entire narrative coming from the United States was about China and to demonize China rather than improve cooperation and lead from the front. But the most important aspect, ladies and gentlemen, was that domestic politics triumphed everywhere. Because for governments, incumbent governments, there was a great horror that this pandemic and the implications that it has upon health and the economy would redound to the, advantage, to, to the disadvantage of incumbent governments in terms of the elections that were going to take place. And some of the most horrible aspects of domestic politics became manifest in that short period. During crises, governments are tested, individuals are tested. And you can see today when you look back at, uh, when you look back at these two years, how poorly uh, you know, domestic governments performed. In the, you know, of course, about Donald Trump. I need not elaborate anymore. He has been stigmatized by almost every major writer in the United States who has said that the low standing of the United States today, globally, is largely because of the handling of the pandemic and by Donald Trump personally. It is not personal. It is a systemic failure of an entire nation. Look at, in the case of the United Kingdom, the Prime Minister spoke about herd immunity and did not take any serious action in regard to testing. And as a result of this herd immunity purpose, you found thousands upon thousands of elderly people died in old age homes because there was no social distancing and health workers had not been immunized. In our own country, several task forces were set up. And the, social, uh, and the Solicitor General told the Supreme Court of India that out of the 12 or 13 task forces, oops, we forgot to set up one about migrant workers. The government of India did not know that there are several hundred million migrant workers. And with this great bravado, when our country was locked down, hundreds of thousands of them overnight faced a life of an extraordinary nightmare. And that is something that will bite our conscience for several years to come. The WHO has been found wanting seriously. But anyone who's familiar with this knows that an international institution is only as effective as its members would wish it to be. And no member wants the WHO to be particularly effective because it involves giving up some aspects of your own sovereignty to a larger purpose, and that does not happen, and it has not happened. We had some instances of cooperation. In the case of the European Union, no country came to the assistance of Italy. And it is China that sent them hundreds of thousands of masks, something that is referred to as mask diplomacy. We also heard about vaccine diplomacy that in very small numbers, actually a small person, a small fraction of the demand in certain countries, vaccines were sent from one place to another. But there were far greater restrictions on the supply of vaccines 
than there had said than there should have been and actually national interest was to be triumphant at that time including in our own country if there was any distribution it was largely focused on geopolitical interests so that you had asia pacific benefiting from these inputs relating to vaccine and other uh, other equipment but it went rather than sub saharan africa because sub saharan africa's geopolitical value at that time was considered negligible what have we learned now after this two and a half years of experience that instead of international cooperation it is nationalist considerations that are likely to triumph in the handling of serious transnational health crisis number 2 that domestic politics domestic considerations domestic factors are likely to be absolutely supreme in influencing the decision making of our leaders the responses of major powers will be influenced almost entirely by their geopolitical interests also we have noticed every nation in the world has an extremely fragile grossly inadequate health infrastructure the no country can say that we came out of it well almost all of them seriously collapsed and it has taken a very long time to get some degree of recovery but we have a very long way to go global cooperation was practically non existent so there is now some talk there is a brief respite given to us with regard to the 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 virus is not in retreat it is mutating and you could get another virus which may be seriously lethal in this short period the who has come up with a new treaty they want to strengthen the agreement relating to international health regulations they want to give more power to the who it's known as the pandemic treaty so that you have uh, you you can give authority to the who to actually intrude into the way nations function and operate for example it was found that one of the aspects of the international health regulations is that you must report immediately when you see the first hint of something emerging that could be of transnational concern and it was seen that this was not actually honored in china at all and that is not unnatural because countries at that stage a did not know what is the issue in front of them how serious it is and also there are concerns of national image concerns of national security etc so yes there have been very serious controls over information flows globally and even today we are struggling to get report we get figures even basic figures statistics that are crucial for 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 future planning we do not have those figures at all even our municipal authorities our state authorities and certainly our national authorities are not interested in actually giving out figures that would show us in a poor state there is now a lot of talk and if you go to the internet and you press two words health diplomacy you will be overwhelmed with article upon article we should do this health diplomacy every embassy must have an health attache like you have a defense attache you must have a health attache none of that is going to happen the facts of life are very clear before you the pandemic has taught us many lessons none of them is of significance or relevance nations are going to function on the basis of their own interest governments will steer the course of national policy in order to win the next election and that is going to be the fact of life and i am not sure this is going to change some good plans are there on paper an emergency health force every country should have just as we have national you know disaster management at home professionally qualified people ready to be unleashed we should have something like this on an international scale each country should develop a kind of cadre that can be used for such occasions number 1 number 2 specialized groups for disaster response also setting us out funding funding for a larger national in, in a global purpose each country should contribute and say that look yes here is my fund for this uh, global response rapid response far greater cooperation in science and technology vaccine technology will any one of this take it seriously very doubtful because 
Big Pharma still exists, and I'm not sure they're interested in cooperating in any way. Looking out for vulnerable areas, vulnerable areas of sub-Saharan Africa, large parts of Latin America, large parts of South Asia. Very poor, very low geopolitical value, therefore it's not going to happen. I'm, I am unhappy about giving this pessimistic message to you. As of now, this is what my studies have shown. I don't see anything which would enable us to rejoice. We are today very seriously facing very serious problems. And I think we as a nation too, so long as the priority are not health and are not the vulnerable sections of our community, we will remain extremely vulnerable to crisis such as the one that we have gone through recently. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we're running short of time, so there is really no time for questions. Uh, but that said, I would invite all of you, if you have questions, please direct them to the organizers, and we will get them across to our speakers and get them to respond to you. May I please invite Dr. Rajiv Yarurika to felicitate our speakers. And Ambassador Talmizem. Thank you, sir, for such an enlightening session.